<laughs> okay, so today's speaker, today's speaker is Kelvin Bates. Um, he's been here for a week and he's going to be here for just one more week. Uh, he it has two fellowships, one with the NOAA Climate and Global Change period, and then <laughs> the Harvard University Center for Environment. Um, so he yeah, has two postdocs. He earned his PhD in chemistry at Caltech, where he studied the gas phase oxidation and aerosol formation mechanisms of isoprene in chamber experiments. And in 2017, he moved to the frigid Northeast to incorporate those mechanisms into the GEOS Chem, a global chemical transport model. And um, he investigates the tropospheric effects of biogenic VOCs. And today he's going to talk about odd oxygen. Yes, indeed. Get away. Cool. All right. Thank you for the, ooh, not used to a microphone. Um, thank you for the introduction and for having me here, Eric, especially. It's been a very uh, rewarding, fascinating week so far of conversations about methanol and acetone. I'm sure it'll be another one this week. Um, yeah, I'm actually here mostly to look at the uh, budgets of oxidized volatile organic compounds especially in the remote troposphere, um, and what we can say from both ATOM data and global models about where those come from uh, and where they go. So this is totally out of left field for me. In fact, it's out of left field from my graduate work too, which was all yeah experimental stuff on organic chemistry. Um, so I thought I would try something new. thought I would talk about something that is pretty much in its infancy still, but uh, I hope will be of some interest here, and I hope people here will have some uh, thoughts and ideas about, because it's all just starting out. Um, we're just starting to apply it in models and starting to look at its implications. So if anyone has any thoughts on it, uh, yeah, I'll be curious to hear them. All right, that's enough background. Um, Given where I am and who I'm talking to, I don't think I need to go into much about why we care about tropospheric ozone. It is, of course, a potent greenhouse gas and bad for plants and a big contributor to human morbidity and mortality throughout the troposphere. So instead, I thought I'd start with some fun facts that you might not know about ozone um, that are totally irrelevant, but I find them interesting. <laughs> ozone comes from a Greek word, ozane, which means to smell because people had actually written since like ancient Greece about how a characteristic smell comes with lightning. Uh, and it was in the 1840s that people realized that this was from the interaction of electricity with oxygen. And then they started to piece together that it was some chemical compound that came from that. And so they gave it that name, ozine or ozane, not really sure. Um, it was only a few years later, 1848, I think, that they first proposed uh, a structure for it as a polymer of oxygen. And then interest in ozone really took off, and people started uh, getting excited about its properties as a disinfectant. And so I found this great quote from the 1870s where a guy named Cornelius Fox, which sounds like a fake name to me, but it's not apparently, <laughs> said that ozone should be pumped into mines and cities and sick rooms as a disinfectant, which luckily did not happen. Um, although you can still buy you know, air purifiers that are basically just ozone generators if you really want. Um, so enough of the, of the irrelevant background. For some relevant background, it was in the late 1800s, 1890s, that people started turning their attention towards ozone in the atmosphere. Of course, quickly realized most of it's in the stratosphere, so the attention went up there. And that's a whole long history that I won't go into here. It was in the 1950s and the ozone events, smog events in Los Angeles in particular, that people realized ozone could be present in the troposphere in sufficient quantities to be harmful. So it's really a relatively young history of studying ozone in the troposphere. Um, and even through the 1970s, the main idea behind ozone in the troposphere was that it was produced in the stratosphere from photolysis of oxygen and then transported down and then lost to deposition of the surface. And the vertical profiles of ozone that you see through most of the troposphere would pretty much hold up to this. It's just an increasing profile with height. Um, but in 19, 
71, I think, Chip Levy proposed that the photolysis of ozone and the formation of uh, excited singlet oxygen could then react with water and produce OH, which is great. It's good that we have that to clear out all the CO and methane that would otherwise build up in the troposphere, but it does throw a wrench in this whole scheme because if we're going to lose about 90% of our ozone to that photolysis reaction, we need some major sources in the troposphere to balance that. This will come in handy sometime soon, I think. Um, and so the next few decades went towards finding some of those mechanisms that would form ozone in the troposphere, and we get to the view of tropospheric ozone that we have today, which is mostly this. There are some complications to it, but it's not too bad. The main sources of ozone in the troposphere being still transport from the stratosphere, but about 10 times larger, the in situ production of ozone from the catalytic cycles of nitrogen oxides and hydrogen oxides, driven largely by the emission of CO and VOCs. Um, and then the sinks of ozone, still deposition, but large contributions from in situ photochemical loss, either through the production of molecular oxygen or OH. And the balance of these processes and terms determines our tropospheric ozone loading. So considerable effort has gone into quantifying these terms in tropospheric ozone budgets using global models. Can I ask you a when you look at the budget that you show there, there is quite a, I mean, the position is the, the loss, but there is other losses of also, or or it, <laughs> which is H2O2, that's from H2O2 and HNO3, that's from HNO2. Yes, indeed. So if you don't take that into account, the budget might be constrained. Exactly, which is why it's not quite that simple. Perfect little leading question there. We can't really define this just as ozone, because if we did, we would miss most of the most important, at least sinks, but also sources of ozone or the compounds that cycle with ozone in the troposphere. So these budgets are complicated by the rapid cycling of ozone with various trace species. The first one that we think of usually being atomic oxygen. So ozone photolyzes readily in the troposphere, you get atomic oxygen, recombines with molecular oxygen, you get your ozone back. The cycle is fast, it's efficient, and it hardly affects the total loading of ozone in the troposphere whatsoever. So if we counted these as sinks and sources of ozone, we would get huge numbers that are in no way relevant to an actual budget of where ozone comes from and where it goes. So we would rather ignore this. And we could say the same, about a whole bunch of other species that we cycle ozone with. So NO2 among them. And then the species that NO2 cycles with, of course, can be added to this. It gets complicated. It's not terribly important. The main point is that all of these cycles are, to some extent, fast and efficient, and to a large extent, don't affect the overall loading, at least in as much as they actually complete this cycle of ozone. And so in order to ignore all these terms, we define odd oxygen, or OX, as the sum of all of these species. And so now any single reaction that converts between them does not constitute a source or a sink. And we can ignore it and be happy looking at our budgets in terms of the production and loss of total OX instead of ozone. Easy enough, right? People have been doing this for a very long time since we really started putting together odd oxygen budgets back in the 70s, uh, at least in the troposphere, and using various combinations of all of these compounds. Um, recently, there's been a bigger effort to put a bunch of halogen chemistry in, so this isn't quite the whole story. You can get halogens cycling with all sorts of aspects of this chemistry, for example. Um, again, fast and efficient cycles, again, don't really affect the overall loading of ozone in most cases. And so we can add those in to our definition and arrive at some hopefully mutually agreed upon combination of species that we call odd oxygen. And once we do that, we have a good metric for compiling ozone budgets and comparing them across models. So for example, this is a recent intercomparison just last year, Young and coworkers, 
looking at a whole bunch of models, um, and they found that while a lot of aspects of models have improved in recent years, the spread in budget terms really has not. And so you can see that there's a spread in a factor of a factor of two in the production and loss terms of odd oxygen between models. Um, and even though they're somewhat more minor components, can I do this? Yes. Deposition and stratospheric influx have even larger relative variance across models. Um, despite that, though, the burdens of ozone in the troposphere in all of these models are relatively more consistent. And you might ask why that is. And the somewhat unsatisfying answer that I've always gotten from that question is that it's largely that models are tuned for this to a greater or lesser extent. Um, a chemical transport model getting ozone wrong would be like a climate model getting temperature wrong. It's just not OK. So we tweak little aspects of it to get it right. Also, ozone is readily observed throughout the troposphere, um, easily compared and benchmarked to these models. So that makes this a relatively easy process as well. So you frequently see things like this paper, who and coworkers in, uh, in Geoschem, my chemical transport model of choice. Um, comparing OMI to Geoschem, looking at where it's off, what sources might be going into that, finding, for example, that, say, lightning NOx is a underestimated source of NOx in the parts of the atmosphere where we're getting ozone wrong, and so making little, little adjustments to that, for example. But I would argue that that's not the whole story of why there are differences between models. Um, some of it is in how we define odd oxygen to begin with. So for the first part of this, there are inconsistencies in our definitions of odd oxygen across models. Some models, some studies that I've seen using these models just use this kind of most basic definition of odd oxygen. Some add in the acids and the peroxy acyl nitrates. Some go further and add organonitrates to this and, of course, the halogen chemistry to varying extents. There's also some inconsistencies, potentially, in the coefficients that we give all of these. So for example, NO3 made in the reaction of NO2 with ozone, each of which carries an odd oxygen. So you put them together, NO3 has to carry two equivalents of odd oxygen. That's pretty straightforward. But some of these are a little less straightforward. So nitric acid, for example, can be made in multiple different pathways in the atmosphere, a number of them. Two major ones, these ones have different amounts of odd oxygen going into them. So depending on the coefficient that you give nitric acid in your model, these two reactions will have different impacts, for example, on your odd oxygen budget, potentially. I would argue that another inconsistency in odd oxygen budgets is a little more fundamental. Um, that their standard odd oxygen definition has some kind of theoretical deficiencies as well. Uh, so to go back to our scheme of tropospheric ozone, I'm going to simplify this a little bit. We now include NO2 in odd oxygen, so I can just cut that out right here. And now I'm going to resize all of these arrows by their relative importance to the odd oxygen budget, or the ozone, I suppose, budget. And this is what I get. So you can see that the main sink, a little over half in at least Geoschem and a couple other models that I have played with, of odd oxygen is this reaction of O singlet D with water to produce OH, right? But that is not really a sink of ozone, because that OH is going to go on to react with your CO and your VOCs to produce peroxy radicals. And that peroxy radical is going to react with NO, probably, unless it undergoes some other possible reactions to reproduce your ozone. So OH and HO2, in this case, could be considered, in a sense, just another set of reservoir species of odd oxygen, albeit a reservoir that is heavily moderated by the importance of NO here. And any model or definition of odd oxygen that discounts this is, to some extent, underestimating the lifetime of ozone because if it goes through this cycle, you have to kind of question whether it has actually died and come back to life as, odd, as ozone or odd oxygen, or whether that was just part of its cycling. 
And to the extent that it does that, you are also underestimating the importance of other sources and sinks of odd oxygen. So ideally, we would have a family definition that somehow incorporates this other reservoir over here, this other cycle of Hawks, while also still acknowledging the importance of NO as a sort of driver of that cycle. And so we've been trying to do that, and the framework that we've come up with right now is to add another family and call it OZ. Uh, you might recognize the subscript Z from some other fun families of interest. Uh, you can think of this pretty analogously to those. So for example, for the nitrogen and hydrogen oxides, we have a small family, subscript X, that includes just the rapid cycles. And then you have a extended family that interacts less often with that rapid family. Your in-laws and your cousins, however many times removed, that come into play mostly as reservoir species. And these reservoir species usually require some external input, be it light or heat, to be converted back into the rapid cycling reservoir. And then the sum of your rapid cycling reservoir and your, res your rapid cycling species and your reservoir species is your subscript Y family over here, if you will. So we can do the same thing with odd oxygen. In this case, OX is the same OX family that I was talking about before. The exact number of species that are in it are going to depend on your chemical mechanism. So if you have all of the halogens in there doing their cycling, they should be in this OX. But not all chemical mechanisms are going to be the same in that sense. And then your OZ consists of, like I was saying before, the Hox family, basically. But we can't really consider the Hox family alone, because the Hox family cycles with the HOZ family on a time scale that is still relevant to these. So instead, I have to extend this a little bit and call it the whole HOY family. And once we played around with this a little bit in a model, we realized we definitely have to extend that to larger halogen reservoir families as well which act pretty analogously to the Hox family in their interactions with ozone. Um, I should also draw attention to this 0 0.5 here. That comes from this main reaction that we were talking about earlier of O singlet D with water to produce OH. It's one O singlet D producing two OHs. So to balance it, you need that 0 0.5. And a lot of the other, all of the other, I suppose I should say, um, coefficients on those species just kind of fall out from that. One little perk that we get from this definition is that nitric acid now balances in all of its production reactions because this one now has OH in it, which we now give 0 0.5 equivalents of OZ. So if your nitric acid counts as 1.5 equivalents of OY, then both of these reactions balance Oh, why? Fun little perk here. Um, so to think of this a little more intuitively, at least I think of it more intuitively with some schematics, here's a little diagram of how this odd oxygen, extended odd oxygen family works in practice. You have your production terms. So the direct input of, odd, of OX comes almost exclusively from the stratosphere. There's some contribution of uh, upper tropospheric O2 photolysis. Um, at least we do include that in geoschem, and it becomes something like 10 or 20 percent of this. But in order to run these simulations so that we could perturb the stratospheric source most easily, we just turn that off in this case. Um, and then your inputs of OZ, I was kind of surprised to find, are almost entirely carbonyl photolysis, and mostly formaldehyde photolysis at that. You have your chemical losses of both, and I want to stress here that these are now terminal losses to long-lived species, oxygen and water, or at least stable and abundant species. Water is maybe not hugely long-lived, depending on where you are. But these are dominated by the reactions of ozone with HO2 and OH over here, and on the other side, the reactions of OH with mostly peroxides and HO2. Uh, deposition contributes to both of these families, largely of ozone from OX and peroxides. That's what we were getting at before from OZ. 
And then you have your cycling terms. So these are the main reactions that we've already talked about, but the cycling of OX to OZ is accomplished almost exclusively by the reaction of O singlet D with water. And then the cycling of OZ to OX is accomplished almost exclusively in the reactions of NO with HO2 and other peroxy radicals. I should note, though, crucially, that this is not just a conversion of OZ to OX. You're regenerating OH in this reaction, so you are OZ neutral. And so we need to add this extra arrow on here, which turns out to complicate this a lot. Not necessarily irretrievably, but it certainly makes any equations that you get out of this a little more uh, dicey, I guess. And it shows how NO is not just serving to convert one species to another, but is really serving to amplify this whole cycle. So we've plugged this into GeoSchem, uh, like I said, our chemical transport model of choice, I suppose. Um, and here I'm expressing the conversion through each of these pathways in terms of teragrams of ozone equivalents per year, which is a little bit of a silly sounding unit, but it is the one that is most frequently used in ozone budgets. Um, a few things that you can see right off the bat, this conversion of OZ to OX is the largest single term here, and indeed those conversion terms really dominate this whole family, which kind of goes to show how interconnected these are and how interconnected perhaps we should think of them. And then you can also see that the absolute loading of the OZ family is substantially smaller, which is nice because one convenient thing about using OX in past budgets is that it can be pretty much considered to be equivalent of the loading of ozone. This is about 98 or 99% ozone. And so even when you include the whole OY family, you're still 95 or 96% ozone, right? So beyond providing a consistent definition of odd oxygen and accounting for the cycling of OX and HOX and connecting ozone to its real terminal sources and sinks of molecular oxygen and water, we get some um, fun implications for understanding tropospheric ozone from this framework, which I will start going into now. So if I shift this up here, um, I'm going to put some equations up here. Please don't be scared. I know when I was, uh, I don't know, I, I'm perfectly happy with a bunch of molecular formulas up here and a bunch of organic chemistry diagrams. Sean and I were talking about this before. As soon as you put equations up here, kind of start to glaze over. I promise these will be useful and few and important. So the first thing we can define is a chain length, N, I will call it, or an ozone production efficiency for OZ, basically. And that is the flux, maybe not the perfect word for it, but flux through this pathway divided by the other loss processes of OZ. And it basically gives you the number of OXs produced per unit of OZ. And using these numbers that we get out of a tropospheric annual average from Geoschem, that turns out to be 1.6. So any given unit of OZ will produce 1.6 ozones, basically. We can also use this to write out steady state burdens of OX and OZ. Those look small. Oh, well. Um, importantly, these are not to be taken too seriously because there are lots of nonlinearities in this system. These will not apply for big perturbations. They probably won't apply for smaller scales where ozone and, and all of these, these different species are not terribly well mixed. But we can use them to kind of build a framework of tropospheric ozone overall and hopefully kind of conceptualize small perturbations to it. So if I combine those and bring N in, you can get this equation for the tropospheric burden of odd oxygen, OX. And you get some fun things from this equation. So first, the denominator is basically the loss processes of ozone, or OX, in the troposphere. Um, and so it basically tells you the lifetime of ozone through the troposphere. And if we calculate this out in all of, with all of the numbers up above, you get a lifetime of ozone of 63 days which seems a little long to me. If you calculate it out the old way, where you include this as an absolute loss process, you would get, in Geoschem, 22 days. In most models, somewhere on the order of 20 to 35 days that I have seen. So a tripling in Geoschem, or a doubling from kind of a model average, 
of the lifetime of ozone in the troposphere, which tells us, although we kind of could have put this together before, that this is not really a sink of ozone, but technically a source of ozone as long as n is greater than 1 in this case, which it is. Um, you're probably wondering if this actually plays out in the atmosphere. So we ran a few perturbations in geoschem where we just instantaneously bump ozone up or down. And we found that the e-folding time to get back to its steady state was somewhere on the order of 50 to 70 days, depending on whether it was bumped up or down in summer or winter. But in any case, this gave us at least some indication that we are on the right track here, that this is an actual time scale that exists in the troposphere, perhaps not throughout the troposphere, but as an overall average. Uh, the longer effective lifetime of ozone down here also has some interesting implications for the importance of sources as well. So if we go back to that equation, the numerator here is basically just telling you the sources of ozone. You have your stratospheric input and then your uh, input of PZ moderated by that cycling efficiency, right? And so if we wanted to look at the relative importance of the stratospheric input, it's just the fractional contribution of PX to that numerator right here. And if we do that for this new extended family definition, we would get a fractional contribution of 28%. Whereas if you just con consider it in relation to OX alone, where you're comparing it to this flux, you would get 10%. So which of those plays out? To do that, we, like I was mentioning earlier, perturb that stratospheric source um, and found a surprisingly linear 25% from, this is three simulations, we've since done a whole bunch more and made sure we've tried some different ways of doing so to try to convince ourselves that this was reasonable. Um, so the new definition seems to give a somewhat more accurate view of the contribution of stratospheric ozone to the troposphere. There are other reasons that this could be different, for example, changes in the cycling efficiency with altitude throughout the troposphere. And so we're still digging into some of that. We're also starting to dig into other perturbations and how well they can be explained by this odd oxygen framework. So the next one that your mind might go to would be the other contribution to the numerator here, PZ. Our, is formaldehyde photolysis really responsible for like three quarters of our ozone in the troposphere? That would seem surprising to me. Um, if we do calculate this out in the new method, you would get, well, the remainder from the stratospheric one that we talked about before. So yes, 72%. The old way of looking at odd oxygen doesn't really weigh in on this. Obviously, the PZ arrow doesn't point to OX. Um, but if we calculated it out just without thinking about any cycling in here, you might think that this contribution is the contribution of PZ relative to the three different inputs to OZ times the contribution of OZ to the two different inputs of OX, and you would get 10%. So those are very different numbers. Surely we can test which of these is more actually plays out in at least simulations of the troposphere. Um, it's a little less straightforward how to do this, though. And so we've tried a few different things. One thing that we tried was to perturb methane. Um, it's a pretty crude way of doing it. But of course, most formaldehyde, not most, plurality of formaldehyde comes from methane in the atmosphere, in the troposphere. And if we do that, we would get a change in tropospheric ox burden versus change in PZ that implies a contribution of about 46%. Kind of halfway between these. Uh, if we try to go more direct and just change the formaldehyde photolysis rate alone, you get a very different answer of 2%. So no, changing formaldehyde photolysis is not going to just completely destroy your ozone in the troposphere. But I think we all could have guessed that. Um, this is basically just to say that we shouldn't be trying to apply this framework to every aspect of tropospheric ozone by any means. But rather, we should pay closer to attention to 
the factors controlling each of these processes, the feedbacks and the nonlinearities that are inherent in this system. So for example, when we perturbed ozone alone, well, conveniently, we have a fairly straightforward chain of dependencies here where ozone factors into largely just the loss processes of ozone here, right? Obviously, there's some feedback in this loop, but this is the direct implications of perturbing ozone. But when you start perturbing PZ and perturbing the loading of OZ and probably the fractionation of your different OZ species, importantly, you get very different effects on this, including a big contribution of changing your ozone loss process here, because most of that is through reactions with HO2 and OH. So none of this is going to be linear or straightforward in a way that lets me conveniently apply all of those equations to every aspect of this. But again, shouldn't be surprising. We're still kind of teasing apart where we can apply this, where it's useful, and where it's not. One place that we think it will be useful is in tagging ozone. Um, so for those of you not familiar with this idea, um, it's not the childhood playground game. Tagging of ozone refers to labeling ozone from where its origins are, basically, um, frequently by source region. And then you look in some receptor region, like, say, Colorado, and try to figure out how much of the ozone over Colorado right now was produced, say, over China, for example. And you do that by uh, paying attention to where this reaction right here takes place. So either when this reaction takes place or when the NO is emitted, you tag it. You say this is Chinese NO if it was emitted in China. And then when that reaction happens, you say this is Chinese ozone from that Chinese NO, for example. And then you track that around the world and you see how much of it ends up in Colorado, for example. And you get fun graphs like this. This is from Tim Butler in um, Potsdam, I think. Um, I think in this, yeah, Colorado is included in the Southwest US in this. So March, we can see that a big, I don't know, five-ish, a little more than five PPB of our ozone is from the stratosphere, for example. A good chunk is from East Asia. A good chunk is from in situ production, though as it always will be. We have, a, I guess, a large contribution from Mexico and Central America in the fall and late summer, interestingly enough. Um, there's a bunch of different ways to tag ozone, though. This doesn't have to be the way you do it. You can also do it by where the Hox or RO2 radical came from that you are undergoing this reaction with. So. Tim Butler also did this one, I guess. And um, here we're separating NOx out not by its location of origin, but by the emission sector, and also doing basically the same thing for the HOX or HO2 or RO2 partner. And you can see you know, there's a large contribution from methane, but also in the northern hemisphere, large contribution from anthropogenic VOC sources leading to that HO2 or RO2 reaction partner. And in all of these cases, there is, of course, some source from the stratosphere. I believe in these, he's not saying that that's NOx from the stratosphere. He's saying that that's ozone from the stratosphere that is still tagged as coming from the stratosphere. And so it counts on top of all of these other sources that come from reactions with NOx. And this is the part that would be changed in our new extended odd oxygen framework of looking at this. So it's not entirely intuitive to me how exactly we would turn this into a tagging scheme. There's probably a bunch of different ways. Um, the one that seems most important, of course, though, is that we separate out this PX and PZ fraction. And so in the old way of tagging, like I mentioned, anything, as soon as it goes through this pathway, that's when you tag it, and that's where you say it became odd oxygen. But if instead we let anything that comes through here, no matter how many times it cycles, still be called stratospheric, then you're going to get a larger theoretical contribution of stratospheric ozone in your tagging budget. And indeed, when we do this, in geoschem at least, we do get an increase in the fraction, fractional contribution of stratospheric odd oxygen to the total. 
I was a little surprised to see that the strongest relative effect is at the surface. So down here, your surface contribution of stratospheric odd oxygen doubles from 15 to 30%. Um, and if we look at how that actually plays out, it kind of, this is the total loading of ozone at the surface. I just picked one month out of a tagging simulation. May means larger contribution from the stratosphere in the northern hemisphere. Um, but across the board, you can see that the input of, or the fraction of ozone that is attributable to the stratosphere is increased. And if we look at that as a relative difference from the old to the new, well, here's the absolute difference, and that is the relative difference. You can see that the amount that is from the stratosphere increases most in the northern hemisphere. That's partly due to the fact that there's more influx in the northern hemisphere in the winter and spring, and partly due to the fact that higher NO in the northern hemisphere and higher light and water in the tropics means higher cycling efficiencies throughout that area of the atmosphere which lets this stratospheric ozone cycle more efficiently. So we're still playing around, like I said, with how to do this tagging. We can also add tags for how many times your ozone has gone around this, or your odd oxygen has gone around these cycles, which is kind of another fun thing to keep track of. And when we do that, this is maybe a little harder to see, but every darker section of each of these um, is another time around the cycle of odd oxygen for your both your stratospheric source and your PZ source. Um, and it's not quite clear from this, but from this, hopefully, it is that the number of cycles that your odd oxygen has gone through increases substantially with decreasing altitude. Um, unclear quite how useful this is, but it is, like I said, another fun thing that we can play around with with this new framework. We're still playing around with all of the other things we can do with it, including the fact that this can be combined, of course, with NOx source tagging, regional tagging, and all of those fun things. The problem being that every additional tag makes for many more reactions to add in, and many more species to track, unfortunately. Um, so this is about as far as we have taken this whole extended odd oxygen family framework so far. Um, hopefully there are new directions we still can take it, but hopefully I have convinced you that even if it's not completely useful for practical application, it still gives you a better recognition for the role of the reaction between O singlet D and water to produce OH as a source rather than a sink of ozone in the atmosphere. It relates ozone back to its fundamental uh, terminal sources and sinks of O2 and water. Um, we get more self-consistency in the coefficients on our uh, odd oxygen family constituents, so that's nice. And importantly, it reveals some interesting implications for the lifetime and stratospheric influence of tropospheric ozone. Um, I think this is a particularly interesting time to be playing around more with this in models, especially because we're getting more and more big, fun data sets to compare to um, with both IGAX, Tropospheric Ozone Assessment Report, compiling huge databases of surface ozone measurements, and then more spatial and temporal resolution from satellites as well. And I would be happy to talk with anyone about any aspect of this. I want to thank the people who are paying me to do so. and. Uh, yeah, thanks again to Eric for having me here. Yes, microphone. It's on, yes. Hey, um, I have kind of a naive question uh, about um, the point of, of, of defining chemical families, um, as you said, to separate rapid, um, abundant exchanges from things that affect ozone over longer time scales. And I'm just wondering if uh, by extending the family, are you extending that defined time scale that defines the family? And is that why you're actually getting a longer lifetime? <laughs> 
Right. Uh, in general, the more species that we add to this, yes, we will just continue expanding and expanding the lifetime until you, unless you start adding species that um, that do not act as cycles that act as sinks. So if you, you, we can also start taking species away from the OX definition, and you notice shorter and shorter lifetimes, and so. The question basically just becomes what time scale here is useful. Part of that might be what time scale actually plays out in the atmosphere in terms of when yeah, you get showed perturbed, what do you some see? perturbed perturbation experiment. What yeah. what did that involve? So that we've tried a number of different ways of doing that. Those ones that I ended up showing literally just involved scaling the ozone loading in the troposphere instantaneously by plus or minus 10%, and then continuing to run the model forward and seeing what happened, which obviously changes a bunch of other things at the same time. We've played around with changing ozone and also changing, for example, all the other constituents of OY, or also changing methane to what it would be in a steady state with all of those things. Um, but what you were plotting was, act was just O3, not um, I think what I ended up plotting, I'll pull that back up here. I actually have a different, perhaps more interesting version of it here. There we go. Um, what I'm plotting here is the percent difference from the baseline tropospheric burden of ozone. But if you plot OX or OY, it looks exactly the same because ozone is such a large constituent of that. On this version of it, let's see. This, these ones are the ones I showed earlier. This is this from the same simulation, but just looking at the lowest kilometer of the atmosphere. You get a different response, unsurprisingly, because the rates of all of these things are very different in the lowest kilometer. So that is to show, to say that this might not play out spatially the same way everywhere. But there is some scale spatially on which this time scale of, at least in this model, 62 months, not 62 months, Thank two you. months, plays out uh -huh. in the troposphere, I guess. OK. Just a quick question, maybe something I didn't understand. In your uh, box that shows OY, in which you have OX and OZ, yeah, mm -hmm. you have the value somewhere in another plot of px, yeah. lx, dx. They don't balance. <laughs> yeah. So what's missing so this, in the? Okay. This box is very confusing to glance so at. What's missing? There must be some production missing there or something. And that is because of this feedback right here. So this is regenerating all of this OZ and producing another equivalent of 4,500 right here. So 4,500 plus those inputs should balance with these so outputs. 45 is really an external production, in a way. Done it's internally. an external production for which the, one of the inputs is entirely internal. So yes, representing this in this normal box method is perhaps not the most intuitive. Uh, this is a very interesting, but I um, I feel that the definition heavily depends on many of the physical processes that is largely decoupled from chemistry. For example, how fast is a model removes, how fast does the aerosols and cloud scavenges, for example, nitric acid or nitrate and uh, H2O2, these type of things, because most of the models assume these are permanently removed from the system. And uh, that's obviously played quite important role in the permanent removal of the OX and OZ and also affect the recycle efficiency. Basically, how I see these kind of things is that you have a better way to understand the highly nonlinear system produced by the model itself. Yeah. So, so the, my two part question is firstly, how does the uncertainties of these not completely well captured processes would affect the, all the stuff we're playing with. And secondly, yeah, let's just stick with the first one. <laughs> <Stick with that. laughs> all right. Um, yeah, so the one 
aspects like that that we've played around with most is this stratospheric input, which I write up here as 500. But that's because it is completely prescribed in this model as exactly 500. Um, and you can run this model very differently and get very different results. We have very various different settings for how the stratosphere inputs ozone, or whether you run the stratosphere as an actual chemical system. Other models also do that differently. The idea here is not that we have some answer for the actual numbers around here as they play out perfectly in the atmosphere, but that this is hopefully a better way to compare both models and the relative sources and sinks within models. And when you do come up with better constraints on something like stratosphere tropospheric exchange, was the one we focused on, but also, yes, uh, cloud and aerosol processes, maybe this provides a better way of figuring out how that changed, how that different observation or that change in how we'd like to parameterize it would play out in a model, for example. So the cloud and aerosol processes that you were talking about are, yes, cons uh, parts of sinks in here. Maybe they shouldn't be, necessarily. But at least this framework tells us, to some extent, what would happen if we parameterize those differently in a model and what we might expect given some change to those processes. I was interested by your result that the ozone to single D photolysis is a net dis uh, production of ozone, you said. Yes. There have been several studies, including one with GeoScan, looking at the recovery of stratospheric ozone and what will happen to tropospheric ozone when the UV comes back down a little bit. Mm -hmm. And those studies conclude that as the UV comes down, you will have more regional ozone. Yes. In other words, the UV is destroying the ozone because most of the NOx is in a low, most of the world is in a low NOx environment. Yes. You have UV making, or J singular D making ozone in urban environments where you have high NOx. So I'm just curious, is, is that result NOx dependent or is that for the average NOx globally within GeoScan? So this is for, I suppose you could say it's for the average NOx globally, but it, it's the troposphere-wide Because it, there, there was a paper here. by Zhang et al. Yes. in 2014 showing the exact opposite of that. Well, yes. I would not quite say that's the exact opposite, because we've also played around with that perturbation in this, too, if we just tweak that rate. Well, we've and done work you're right. and found similar results to yeah. Jangato. No, but you're right. We get the same result that they do, which is that that process is not necessarily a net, or perturbations to that process do not necessarily result directly in what you might think from this. This is, this is one of the places where this framework definitely does break down. And that's largely because the influence on OH over here turns out not to be the limiting factor there. You're right that the NOx limitation on this and the fact that OH leads to a whole bunch of other things, like a large fraction of this loss right here, is one of the main nonlinearities in this system. And so that is definitely one of the ways where this framework breaks down, I would agree. Any other questions? So far away. Making you run all over the place, Sasha. So first, are you writing this up, or is it out, or? Uh, we've submitted a really short theoretical little bit on this to GRL, okay. and then we are following it up with all of these different perturbations and taggings and seeing what works and what doesn't is the idea. So when I look at uh, cam cam, and I look at something away from the surface, and I look at the tendency of ozone, or I could, I could look at the tendency of odd oxygen as based on some definition across chemistry, okay? And I compare that to the individual odd oxygen reactions and sum them up, I get a match. So should I, am I doing something wrong? You would say you wouldn't get a match? <laughs> or, I mean, what am I missing there? I would say you could still you could still certainly like balance all of these species within OX, and if we cut off this whole 
right side of this, the arrow is still balanced just fine. So yes, it's not that, uh, I mean, there are some ways, for example, that nitric acid um, coefficient where you can get differences in exactly how what budget you would get depending on how you define your odd oxygen. Although within any odd oxygen definition, maybe you could be internally consistent. The yeah. idea is that, yes, no matter uh, however many species you include in odd oxygen, hopefully you get it to balance, yes. But what that tells you about the timescales on which this system responds or the relative importance of various inputs and outputs from the system might end up differing substantially. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, let's thank Kelvin one more time. <laughs> thank you.